Amen. You may be seated. So good to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord. Appreciate the prayers for our students who are traveling as we speak to Panama City. There's about 60 that have gathered and departed, and we're praying for God to do an amazing work in the hearts of our young people this week as they are at Laguna Beach, and the Lord is uh, going to be speaking their heart through the messages that he's given to the speakers. Um, Cassidy and I are both going to be a part of a service there tonight, so we're going to try to keep it brief this morning. we got to jump right into the car with John's sermon and take off uh, pretty quickly to get on the road uh, to be a part of camp this evening. So if you will, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 7. Luke, chapter 7. We'll be reading verses 1 through 10. Give you a little backstory on how we got to this passage this morning. I was reading in my own personal reading time and came across this passage of scripture in Luke chapter 7 and I just couldn't get it off my mind. It just kept bouncing around in my head like this story is more amazing than we've given it credit to. Uh, it's, just, it's just such an incredible story when you understand the culture of the time, how that this man who was a Gentile, who was a Roman soldier, who was hated by the, the Jews, who was someone who probably would not have sat and listened to someone give a gospel presentation or talk about who Jesus was or claimed to be, this man is the one man in all of Scripture, in all of the New Testament, this is the one person that Jesus marvels at. No one else. There's never been anybody else. All the wonderful people that we read about in Scripture, no one, no human being, did Jesus say, I marvel at that person except for this one man. He didn't say it about John the Baptist. He didn't say it about Peter or Paul. He didn't say it about Mary, his mother. He didn't say that about anyone. But this one man, Jesus marveled at what he did. Now, what's very interesting about this is that according to what we see in Scripture, he never laid eyes on him. He never met him. He, he never stepped foot in his home. But yet he's someone that so impressed Jesus. So what was it about this man that impressed Jesus so much? Well, it was his faith. And nine times out of ten, when we see faith measured by Jesus in the Bible, it's from a negative perspective, isn't it? How many times do we remember Jesus say, oh, ye of little faith? We've, we've heard that so many times. Or, Where is your faith? Or if you could have faith, the grain of a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. It's always from a negative perspective. Like, you guys don't have any faith, and because you have no faith, you're so limited. There's so little that, that, that you're capable of doing because you won't place your faith in me. There are only two times in Scripture that we see Jesus marveling at all, at anything. The first thing we see is over in Mark chapter 6, when Jesus is speaking to his to the home crowd, he's, he's in Nazareth where he was born or where he was raised. Uh, he's born in Bethlehem, but he's raised in Nazareth. So he's, he's in Nazareth, Nazareth his, his, his mom and dad's hometown. He goes into the synagogue, he begins to preach, and he begins to open up scriptures. He, he wants to share with them first that he is the chosen one, he is the called, he's the one that has come to do all that God said he would do for his chosen people. And he reads the scripture and he sits down and they go, nope, he's just, there's no possible way he is who he thinks he is. We watched him grow up. That's Mary and Joseph's boy. Like, uh, no, -uh, no. And the Bible says in that moment that Jesus marveled at their unbelief. But in this passage, we see Jesus, one of only two times in scripture that he marvels at anything. He marvels at the belief of this Gentile Roman soldier who he never meets, but Jesus is so impressed. Let's, let's look at what impressed Jesus so much about this man as we look at Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Now, when he concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people. Now, Jesus is just finishing up teaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount uh, this is the height of Jesus' public ministry. This is, this is well, it's, it's actually in the front end of his public ministry, but it, it's almost like 
he, he's, he started with shock and awe. He's healed a bunch of people. He, he has preached messages that have caused people to really stop and think. He's got this incredible group of people following him everywhere he goes, and now he's entered in Capernaum. It says, he entered Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving, for he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. When Jesus went with them, and when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself. For I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore, I did not even think myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned around and said to the crowd, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well who had been sick. I love this story. There's so many incredible nuances to this story. And if you slow down and read it, you'll find characters and you'll find, you'll find principles and you'll find things that you can apply to your life that's almost a little bit hidden in this story. For one, the first one that jumped out at me was the fact that this man, who is a centurion, who is a Roman, which would make him, especially someone who, is, who has the authority that he has in Caesar's army, he's a pagan. He's someone that does not believe in the same God that the Jews believe in. However, something's happened in this guy's life. He is fond of the Jewish people. The, the, the elders that are speaking to Jesus on his behalf says to him, Listen, this guy, he loves our nation. He loves us so much, he built us a synagogue. Now, when they talk about him building them a synagogue, what they're indicating is that he had the power to approve or disapprove for them to have a synagogue in their community. And not only did he have the power to approve or disapprove it, but he also had the power to accept or deny the funds that would come in for the building of this synagogue. The way this phrase is couched, one would be led to believe that this man actually helped fund the building of the synagogue of the Jewish people. He is definitely a seeker of truth. He's not the only Roman that was a seeker of truth. You might remember when Jesus was brought before Pilate, Pilate asked Jesus after questioning him for some time and being impressed with his answers and his demeanor and his spirit, Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? A seeker. Looking for truth. Those pagans from the Roman uh, background and believing all, about all the different gods and how that hum humanity could become God and all of those things, they knew that what they were following was not the truth. Here's a man who sees truth in the one true God. He sees there's truth in what the Jewish people believe in. He is connected to that truth. He wants to help others to see that truth. He helps them to build a synagogue, and as a result of that, these Jewish elders who come to Jesus, by the way, when you read this story, the first thing that strikes you is, when was the last time you saw Jewish elders from a tribe? In order for them to be considered elders, they would be people within one of the tribes of Israel who were chosen as leaders to go and speak to Jesus on behalf of someone in their community. So we got these tribal leaders that are going to speak on behalf of a Roman pagan. It's an odd story. And these Jewish elders, typically when they're approaching Jesus, they're arguing his teaching or they're being skeptical about what he's capable of doing or who he says he is. But not this time. They come on behalf of someone that they love and respect. They come on behalf of someone who's been very good to them in the midst of a lot of oppression and a lot of darkness where Roman centurions and other communities have been brutal and unfair. This one has been good and generous. 
And so they come on behalf of this centurion. And I think the first thing that jumps out at me at this story that I didn't notice the first several times I read the passage of Scripture was one little phrase that we find in verse 3. It says, so when he heard about Jesus. Did you notice the invisible character in this story? Who's this invisible character that we don't see as we first read this story? We know Jesus is involved in the story. We know there's a crowd of followers behind Jesus. We know there are some Jewish elders from some tribe that are approaching Jesus on behalf of this, this Roman centurion who has a servant who is sick that he's very fond of. So we see all those characters. There's also a character in this story we don't notice right away. But he might be the most pivotal character in the whole story. He might be the one that caused the whole story to exist in the first place. Who is this character? It's the one guy who tells a Roman centurion about Jesus. You know, you know how much courage it would take a Jew to approach a Roman centurion and tell him that there is one true God and his son Jesus is here and he's here for us and he's teaching the kingdom of God and he's healing people on his way and he's performing miracles and he is who he says he is. And when I read this story, I recognize very quickly that this story never takes place if the invisible character doesn't show up. So when he heard about Jesus, the Bible tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So here's our first application. Here's our first hard question in this story. When was the last time you shared Jesus with someone that God placed in your path? Because here's what we see in this passage. This is an incredible story. The only time in all of Scripture where Jesus marvels at the faith of someone, and it only happens because some unnamed character was faithful to be a witness for Jesus Christ. This story doesn't happen without a witness. This story doesn't happen without someone who believes they have the gospel and that they need to share it. How many stories never happen because we hold the truth inside of us and choose not to share it with the people that God places in our path? How many stories, how many miracles never take place because we're silent when God asks us to be bold and courageous? So the first thing we see is this invisible character who really caused this story to even exist in the first place. Then we see the elders. What's their story? The, the elder story is, well, first of all, I gotta, I gotta lead you to one more, one more word before we go further. It says, he sent elders of the Jews to him pleading with him. I want you to notice this also about this Roman centurion. His authority in that area in Capernaum would allow him to demand that Jesus come to his house. He could have demanded that Jesus show up. He could have sent, instead of elders of the Jews, he could have sent one of his 100 Roman soldiers who were under his authority to Jesus and say, hey, the centurion needs you to come to his house. And Jesus would have had to come to the centurion's house or disobey the law that was in place during that time, which he would not have done because the Bible tells us that we are supposed to obey the authority that's placed over us. And so Jesus would have done it. He would have come. But you notice he doesn't do that. He doesn't demand that Jesus show up. You notice the heart condition of this man? Something's happened in him. He's not your typical Roman centurion. He's not the guy that most of Israel has to deal with in their community that's been placed there to keep the peace on behalf of Rome. This is nothing like the typical centurion, which reminds us that when someone is in Christ, he's a new creature, and old things are passed away, and all things become new. This is a completely different kind of human being who holds the job that he has. There's something else special about this guy. 
You see, as he's come to be a believer in Christ, and he is, we are all saved by faith. His faith in Christ is something that caused Jesus himself to marvel. What's interesting about him is that he doesn't allow his assignment to, to supersede his identity. See, a lot of men, especially, we're just built like this. The first thing we say about ourselves is what we do for a living. I love how Paul, when he wrote to Titus, he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, bondservant of the Lord. He says, I have an assignment, but I also have an identity. This, this centurion, he goes, listen, I have an assignment. It's given by Rome. But my identity changes everything about the way I do my assignment. I don't do it like the other centurions because my identity dictates that I'm different than they are. His, his identity supersedes his assignment. So I love that about the centurion. It says in verse 4, when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly. I love this because we don't see this anywhere else. Where do we see Jewish leaders begging Jesus? Usually they're condemning him or criticizing him or trying to trick him. Here we see them earnestly begging. Look at what God does. Look at what God puts together. And they didn't have to because the centurion could have demanded it, but they're begging. And, and they have a case. This guy's good. He's, he's generous and he's kind. and He loves our nation. He's built us a house of worship. You should help him because of his works. You starting to see where I'm going with this? See, the religious leaders of the day couldn't get beyond a works-based favor from God. Oh, we got to work. If we want his favor, we got to work for it. They couldn't get beyond that. I think Jesus sees past their lack of faith, and he sees in the way that he's being invited instead of being demanded to come to the centurion's house. He sees something in this man, and he looks beyond the mistakes that the elders are making, saying, oh, come because of his great works. And so he's on his way, and then the centurion sends, sends some other friends. And Jesus is coming to his house. His, his prayer was answered. And then the centurion sends some other friends and says, hey, listen, now that I've thought this all the way through, I don't know if I want you to come to my house. You see, there are probably some things that you haven't heard about me. I know those people built a case on my behalf, but there are some things they don't know. And because of my faith in you, I know that you know what they don't know. And as a result of you knowing what they don't know, I don't think I'm worthy to have you under my roof. And so Jesus says in his mind, I'm sure, as he's hearing these new friends come and talk to him about this centurion's request, he thinks, well, okay, so do you want your servant to die? What's your play here? And then they continue. He says, I'm a man under authority and I'm a man who has authority. What he's saying to Jesus is if there's one thing I get, it's authority. The people who give me orders, I'm not capable of saying no to them because they have authority over me. And the people that I give orders to, whether they want to do it or not, they have to do it because I have authority over them. And I don't always have to go to every single soldier, all 100 of them that are under my command, and specifically tell them what they need to do. I can make a statement generally over all of the people who are under me, I can make that statement to one person. And as long as they know that it's my word, it's final. That's what authority looks like. And so Jesus, because I have this great understanding of authority, I recognize that if you have authority over this sickness that my servant has, you can just say the word and he'll be healed. 
Because your authority is not based on a physical touch. Your authority is not based on your presence in my house. Your authority is based on the word that you speak. And Jesus hears this. And all these people are listening to him and watching him. And it's interesting to me because we're in such a, a, a volatile political moment in our country, and, you know, what you say matters, everything you say, you better weigh every word, especially if you're in a political race, if you're trying to gather followers, you better pay attention to every word you say and be super cautious how you say it because you don't want anything to be twisted and worked against you, and you, you got to be super careful. And Jesus is standing in front of all these people, and he says something that is absolutely not politically correct. He says, in essence, this Roman could teach all you Jews a lesson. He says, this Roman has a faith that I haven't seen from any of you people here that brag on how righteous you are. I haven't seen faith in you like I see in this Roman soldier. There's something about him that's genuine. It's real. And there's an understanding in him of my heart that you don't have. And so Jesus makes the statement that I, I marvel at this. Then the rest of the story kind of goes like the servants, all of them, the elders, and the second group of friends that came to see Jesus, they all go back to the house. And when they get there, the servant is completely healed. Now he was ready to die, but now he's completely healed. So there's a few things from this story that I think are important to us if we'd like to have the kind of faith that this centurion had. Now, I want to give you three quick points, and then we'll be done. Number one, three attitudes that lead us to marvelous faith. Number one, I am not capable, but you always can. I'm not capable, but you always can. Here's this centurion who has this authority and he realizes that there's some things he has no control over. There is an end to his authority. He, he's, he's somebody who thought he was capable of fixing everything that was broken, but yet when this servant that he loves is sick, he doesn't know where to go. I'm sure, I'm sure he's probably looked at doctors. I'm sure he's probably tried to find other ways to help his dear servant that he loves so much, but nothing seems to be working. And so he's heard from some bold witness about this man, Jesus, and he believes with all his heart that he's capable of healing his servant. When I'm not capable, you always can. I don't know about you, but... When I was growing up in school, and I think everybody has at least one of these, we had a teacher who was notorious for saying those dreaded six words that no student wanted to hear when they walked into their class, and that was, take out a piece of paper, right? Did y'all just count to make sure I said that? How many people just counted to make sure that was six words? What that meant was he was about to give us a pop quiz, right? Nobody likes pop quizzes. Matter of fact, nobody likes teachers who give a lot of pop quizzes. <laughs> but a teacher will give them, and I'd ask that teacher, even as you get older, why, why did you give us pop quizzes? Why in the world would you give a pop quiz? I heard a, another pastor who talked about pop quizzes, and he said that a teacher told him one time, that the reason that you give pop quizzes, this is, this is interesting, the reason a good teacher gives a pop quiz is because in life you never know what's going to land on your desk from one day to the other. And you need to be prepared to handle those things that you didn't see coming. Pretty interesting. Do you know life hands us a lot of pop quizzes, right? We get a lot of pop quizzes that land on our desk every day that we don't see coming. But thank God that 
these pop quizzes are all multiple choice, right? Four different options that we can choose from. Number one, handle it by yourself, A, handle it by yourself. B, call your friends and family and ask them to join you to handle this problem that you got. C, just ignore it and act like it never happened or D, give it to the Lord. Now I'm gonna tell you, there's only one right answer. A, it's the wrong answer because there are gonna be some problems that they haven't come yet. You'll figure out that there's gonna be some problems that you can't handle on your own. They're too big for you. You're not equipped for it. You're not ready for it. You can't handle these problems on your own. They're complex. And a lot of times, they're the ones that carry the biggest consequences if you get it wrong. You can't handle those on your own. B, wrong answer. Friends and family are there to support you and to help you and to guide you, but there's going to be some of these things that land on your desk that they can't get you out of. They can't give you answers or solutions to. They're there for support, but their power is finite. C, just ignore it and run from it, leads to a whole lot more pop quizzes that you weren't expecting. It's just going to lead to more and more issues that you got to deal with. The only right answer is D. The Bible says that we're to cast all our cares upon him because he cares for us. But D requires trust and faith. See, this man realized that he was at the end of himself. He had to trust Jesus. That was his only good answer is to have faith in Jesus. He says, I'm not capable, but you always can. The second thing I notice about this man is he says, I'm not worthy, but you're always willing. This guy is, um, he's come to know a little bit about the heart of God. He's come to know a little bit about the power of God and all the things that God is capable of, like we talked about the last three weeks, his omniscience, that he knows everything, his om omnipresence, that he's everywhere, and his omnipotence, that he's all-powerful. And he recognizes that this God that the Jews worship has these traits, and he begins to give that some thought, and he's, he's thinking to himself, I'm sure those elders were bragging on all the stuff I did, and they're trying to make a case for me as to why Jesus, the Savior, should come to my house. But I know that he knows what only I know. You see, Jesus, there's some things that those guys didn't tell you about me. There's another side to that coin. There's some stuff that I know that you know that makes me feel really unworthy. As a matter of fact, I feel so unworthy that I, I don't even feel like I should have you in my house. I feel so unworthy that I don't feel like I should be in your presence. But it takes real faith to recognize your unworthiness and still understand his willingness. That's that's a basis for a lot of faith. You see, I love what Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16 says. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. What is our confession? Look at this. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet he was without sin. Let us, therefore, because of that, because, did it say that, therefore, we are without sin? It said, therefore, he, he was without sin. He was tempted, but he was without sin. Therefore, it says, because of that, come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, what in that verse says that you've done anything to earn or deserve the favor of God on your life? 
Nothing. We don't ever deserve it. I almost feel like sometimes God looks at our self-righteousness and I see Jesus' attitude in, in the New Testament when he, he looks at these people who believe and they think more highly of themselves than they ought to. They believe that there's something that they're not. And Jesus just goes, that's a harder thing to get past than these people who recognize their sinfulness. They recognize that they're, they're not worthy. But it takes a lot of faith when you know you're not worthy to believe he's still willing. You know why it takes a lot of faith? Because this doubt that is created when we feel unworthy comes straight from the greatest student of human behavior that has ever graced this planet. His name is Satan. He tries his best to make you feel like you should not pray about your issues. You should not bring your cares to the Lord. You should not ask God to intervene in these issues in your life that you just can't seem to fix. You need to just run from God because he is ashamed of you because you are so unworthy. And he's trying to make you believe this every day of your life. The same tactic that he used in the garden when he told Adam and Eve to hide from God after he had convinced them to sin, he's still using on us today. And he's saying, run from God. He is mad at you. He doesn't get you. He feels like you're a disappointment to him. You need to run in the other direction. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit are saying, no, that's not how our Father works. You don't run from him. When you are at your lowest point, run to him. It takes a great faith to recognize that even when you're unworthy, he's still willing. Jesus saw that faith in this man. I love the fact when Jesus paints this picture in the parable of, of what we call the prodigal son, that, G, that the father, who is, G, who, is, who is God the father in the story, runs to his son in his nasty condition, still smelling like the pig pen. He drapes himself around his stinky son with matted hair and looks like he hadn't taken a bath in a month and he wraps himself around him and he kisses him. He completely ignores his condition because he's completely focused on his position. That's my son. And I don't care how he smells and I don't care if he's filthy. My love for him is unconditional takes great faith to recognize that even though we're not worthy, he's still willing. Lastly, this man taught us that my authority is finite, but your word is final. My authority is finite, but your word is final. We are way too dependent on how we feel about our circumstances. First thing we do is wrap our mind around everything we find ourselves caught by, right? I don't think that's a bad thing. Our mind is also called our heart. You know, whenever you see the word heart in Scripture, or you hear people talk about following your heart or whatever it is. It's not that muscle that's pumping blood in the middle of your chest, right? It's like your, your mind. You always hear in these movies, follow your heart. Although God says don't follow your heart, it's deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? Our heart will tell us things that aren't true a lot of times. Our heart will tell us to give up when God is telling us it's way too soon to give up. Our heart will tell us there's no way out when God says, I will never put you in a spot where there's no way out. Our heart will tell us there's no way we're going to make ends meet this month when our God says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. Our heart tells us that this thing couldn't have ended up any worse when our God tells us that all things work together for good to them who love the Lord and are called to, according to his purpose. Our heart tells us lies all the time and we believe our heart instead of believing the final word, the final authority that is the word of God. The thing I love about this man was that he realized when Jesus said something, it was final, it was authoritative, and it was over. Jesus could say whatever he wanted to say and his authority would dictate that that's exactly what was going to happen. 
I love what 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, that we are to take every thought captive and make it obedient to the word of God. <laughs> Isn't that good? Yeah. Take every thought that you think and make it obedient to the word of God. Hold on, wait a minute. My, my heart's lying to me again. I know it's deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? It's lying to me. Take it captive and make it obedient to what God said about that situation. Take that thought captive and tell that thought that you will come under the authority of the word of Jesus Christ. That's what I love about this man. He understood the authority of the word of God. Do we understand the authority of the word of God? Church, can I just say this? We better understand the authority of the word of God. We better be teaching our children the authority of the word of God. By the way, you can't know the authority of the word of God if you don't know the word of God. Amen. Your children can't stand on the word of God if they don't know the word of God. You got to bring your kids to church. You got to put them in programs like Wednesday night where they learn Bible verses and, and build a foundation they got to stand on the authority of the word of God. I know you think that they ought to miss church because they're the next A-Rod. I know. I know they're the next Michael Jordan, and if they, don't, if they miss this tournament, you know, they're just, they're not going to get that college scholarship, and their pro career is going to go out the window. I know you think that, okay? But I'm going to tell you something that's a whole lot more important then all that is that they be strong in the knowledge of the word of God. His word is final. The culture's word will change. Look how fast it changes. It's crazy, isn't it? This is what's right, this is what's wrong. It changes almost daily. Almost every news cycle, it changes from one moment to the next. It just keeps changing. One thing that never changes is the word of God. And it's final in its authority. Do not be tossed to and fro by every wind that blows here on this earth. Stand firm on the word of God. It's the final authority. Don't change your view because culture says so. When God's word is spoken very clearly on an issue. Teach your kids how to stand firm on the final authority, the word of God. I love about this man that he said, God, he said, Jesus, you have the authority to cast out sickness by just your word. Here's the last point I want you to catch. When the, author when the authority of the word of God entered into that centurion's house, his house was healed. Healing came to his house. The, the word of God brings healing to our homes. The word of God brings healing to our nation. The word of God is the final authority that fixes the things that are broken. The word of God brings hope to the hopeless. It brings strength to the weak. Because it has authority. And there's nothing on this earth that can stand against the word of God. So don't ever forget it. You want great faith? Recognize that when you're incapable, he still can. You want great faith? Recognize that when you're not worthy, he's still willing. Recognize that your authority is finite, but his word is final. And when we come to that place, God will look at us and say, look at that faith. See, the only thing that God could ever be impressed about us for would be our faith. We got nothing else to offer. Is our, that's all we got is our faith. Aren't you glad that you're saved by your faith? Anybody other than me glad that you're saved by your faith? Aren't you glad you're not saved by your works? Aren't you glad that you're not saved by the amount of righteousness you can drum up? Aren't you glad? Because guess what? We're all falling short. 
If every one of us this morning were, were told, let's stand up and let's all jump up and touch the rafters in this room. Let's all jump as high as we can and touch the rafters. If we all decided we were going to do that, some of you would jump higher than me. But the distance between you and I is nothing like the distance between us and the ceiling. <laughs> Some of us look around and go, I'm a lot better than he is. Yeah, you're still really falling short. <laughs> Don't trust in yourself. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. But thank God we're not saved by our righteousness. We're saved by the grace of God through faith. So let's all work on increasing our faith. Father, we ask you now that we might be a people that would be known for our faith. We just believe God. We just take God at his word. We're not a perfect people. We're not a people that gets it all right every time, but our faith in the authority of God is strong. So God, I pray that we'll place and continue to place our faith in you. Lord, as the disciples asked Jesus, we ask you this morning to increase our faith. Father, I pray that if there be someone here this morning who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, who's never placed their trust in you, who's never placed their faith in Jesus, as the one who took their place for their sins and shed his blood so that they could be cleansed of their sins. If there's one here that does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that today might be a day when they take their most important step of faith and they leave where they're seated and they come and speak to someone about their need to place their faith in Jesus as their Savior. So God, have your way and may your Holy Spirit do a work that we cannot do. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.